Thank you. Good morning. And it is lovely to be here again at Les Murdy. And Karen and I were speaking this morning just about that great privilege that we have of being able to meet together um, when much of the world is still in isolation, um, still struggling. Um, that, that privilege came home to me a little bit yesterday. I spent part of yesterday at Fiona Stanley Emergency with my son. Nothing drastic, but we did come home with crutches. But to, to walk in there, to be seen straight away uh, and to walk out, that's not a privilege much as a lot of the rest of the world has at the moment, is it? Um, the, those services are overwhelmed with people with COVID, people with that very desperate need. So we're very grateful that we could get the help we needed yesterday. So, yeah, it's, it's been a year, hasn't it, that has reminded us of things we didn't even know were privileges. But I just want to think back a little bit at the moment to a few weeks ago. I was, I was in Woolies. I always seem to be in Woolies. Um, and I passed the aisle where they have what they call the promotional items. You know, they're those sort of seasonal things, things for Easter and Halloween and Christmas and Melbourne Cup Day and you know, back to school and whatever else comes up. You know, all the more reasons to sell you more stuff. Um, something you'll often find there is seasonally themed napkins and paper plates. You know, there'll be some in there at the moment, I'm quite sure, for Australia Day if they're not sold out already. Um, I found something a little bit unusual on this occasion, something I hadn't seen before, piñatas um, proclaiming good riddance 2020. <laughs> so, you know, so you could take a stick, whack the heck out of 2020 and let it know what you really thought about it. And if nothing else good came out of 2020, at least lollies would come out of your piñata. <laughs> so, <sighs> it was just that kind of year, wasn't it? It started out with those horrific bushfires and if you're at all like me, you were following them really closely um, and maybe staying in touch with, with friends and, and family members in various parts of the eastern states. Are you okay? Is it anywhere near you? Um, so that, you know, that they were, yeah, really something else, those fires. We're, we're so used to bushfires, but they were so next level, weren't they? Um, perhaps you also spent a lot of time praying that God would protect the firefighters uh, and that he would protect those who were in those affected areas and their properties and their livestock. And I wouldn't be surprised if I'm not the only person here who spent a bit of time in front of the TV crying um, whenever kangaroos and koalas with their little burnt feet and all those lovely people who took on caring for them, came on the TV, and I reckon that was about every night. Um, I, you know, I have a little bit of a soft spot for that beautiful wildlife that God has gifted this country with. Now, I don't think those bushfires were quite over when floods hit Queensland, again, and I'm sure somewhere in there there was a cyclone or two. About this time, I turned to my husband and I said, well, I'm sure 2020 just threw its worst at us just to get it out of the way. <laughs> Well, that is not going down as one of the great predictions of all time, is it? <laughs> so, I don't think I need to tell you what came next. COVID-19 rocked our world. It turned it totally upside down for a period of time. And in many places, it's still more than upside down. And I'm fairly sure there'll be some changes that will stick with us for a really long time, even if it's little stuff like grabbing that disinfectant wipe for your trolley when you go to Woolies. Um, or that willingness to use Zoom to communicate. Perhaps, like me, you discovered that the length of time you meant to wash your hands for corresponds to the Lord's Prayer. Um, and I found myself doing a lot of praying in the bathroom. Um, but there are very few people in the world whose life wasn't affected in some way by this virus that told us, above all, that however we may try to control our world, we remain vulnerable, finite creatures who do not, surprise, surprise, run the universe after all. We all got a little fed up with hearing that word unprecedented. <laughs> and another thing we heard repeatedly was we're all in this together, whether it was that song that's played in the industry super funds ad, um, or, you know, it seemed to always fit into what our politicians had to say, didn't it? 
at one level we were all in this together, weren't we? Um, And we grumbled about those who weren't really making the effort to be in it with us. The folks who thought that um, they could break quarantine, the toilet roll holders, the people who went and held big family parties when we were all supposed to be in ISO. People who thought that doing it was doing it my way became public enemy number one, well, just behind the virus at any rate. Although we may have been in this together, we weren't all in it in the same way. COVID-19 affected us all differently. For some people, the most pressing issue is, what do I do with all this time on my hands? So, you know, they learned to make sourdough bread from scratch, they learned to knit, they planted veggie gardens... They repurposed old songs with new lyrics about isolation. Uh, They enlivened Facebook with pictures of themselves putting out the bins dressed in odd costumes. Um, And about a zillion memes popped up about coping with ISO boredom. So that was the big deal for some people. But, you know, in the health department and in the hospitals, it wasn't really so much fun. Part of my work is actually in the health department. Um, While I'm not in any way frontline, I could see very much what was going on in that broader picture there. People working overtime trying to plan for this expected influx of critical admissions. They're increasing already stringent cleaning and hygiene procedures, opening COVID clinics, testing hundreds and thousands of people getting prepared to deliver many services via telehealth and running around looking for equipment to do that with and trying to assess how much PPE we had. That was one of the other little terms that came into our vocabulary, wasn't it? PPE, personal protective equipment. So we learned a lot of new things in 2020. As COVID cases climbed in Australia, some of our health services began to really feel the pressure of dealing with this deadly and infectious disease. While most of the country was being ordered to isolate, our health workers were working harder than ever and under more stress than ever. But for those who are in isolation at home, you know it meant different things for different people. For some, it was a chance to reset and reassess. You didn't have to run the kids to different activities every afternoon after school. A lot of the things that kept you busy just dropped off. You had time to think. But for many, it actually meant an increase in pressure, maybe because of job losses, Um, maybe it was because you were working from home and somehow trying to manage your kids. For some, it even meant an increased level of personal danger. At school, it was really clear to us that we were seeing an increase in family separations and an increase in issues of domestic violence that were coming to our attention. It was something expected and one of those things that's very sad to actually see the prediction being right. So while relationships were often the source of problems, those who lived alone experienced a different kind of stress. When Melbourne went into its second lockdown, my friend who's single and lives alone said I almost cried. I suspect she probably did cry. Not knowing when she would see another person face to face, that hit so hard. There are others who are also hard hit by the realities of isolation. We discovered the true extent of what a social creature my dad is. <laughs> the second he was supposed to be isolating at home, and you know he's in that risk category as, as to age, it, it seemed he was down visiting us about every three seconds. Um, any excuse, mum baked a cake, we'll just pop down. Oh, we found a book that will help Josh with his schoolwork, we're just going to drop it in. Um, and we'd, they'd pop down and we'd have these awkward socially distanced conversations on the lawn while we stood there wanting to give each other a hug and then off they'd go. I think at one point they made the trip from Joondal up to Atwell three times in a week. Um, So one meme went round on social media. It said 2020 was the year that all the kids told their parents to keep safe by staying at home instead of the other way round. (laughs) For me and my family, it was a stressful time. It was a Yep, there we go, that's us. (laughs) We might look like a really ordinary family of two parents and a school-aged child, but you see, the thing that makes our family really vulnerable is something you can't see. My husband, Darren, he suffers from cystic fibrosis. 
It's a lifelong genetic illness, which among other things means that he suffers really severe respiratory illness. You know that COVID particularly hits people in that respiratory area. Um, so in 2019, we were told to expect that he would be having a lung transplant within two years. Now, I'm really <laughs> glad to tell you that 18 months later, although he's not really well by other people's standards, he is well enough that he's not likely to be on that list for some time. So I'm so grateful to God for that. And actually, in some ways, 2020 helped, less, less flus. And, but, you know, his health still is a daily concern to us. And, you know, when ordinary colds and flus can be really dangerous for him, the thought of what would happen if he contracted COVID was really hard. Um, you know, we know that young people who are much healthier than him can sometimes end up on a respirator and even dying. So the risk to him, if, if he caught that, was so huge. We responded by sending him into ISO fairly early, taking our son out of school fairly early. As, you know, to, to our frame of mind, um, having our child in a place where he effectively had contact with a 1,000 people a day was the big, biggest single risk factor that we had. Keeping my husband safe became really the driving thing for a period of time. Let me just say that there is no lack of faith involved in taking proper measures to protect oneself or one's family from a deadly illness. God himself commanded the Israelites in the Old Testament to observe quarantine procedures in cases of leprosy. Faith need not be divorced from common sense. So the impact on him is obvious. But of course, that impacts others. That impacted me in big ways. Um, I don't want you to think that I'm having a whinge in any sense. I just want you to get a sense of what it was like for me. Um, so a lot of extra burdens came their way as I had to handle a lot of tasks on my own. Um, you know, when, when he couldn't leave the house and all, all of the things that changed, the extra cleaning, all of that. The biggest task I had to take on was schooling my son. Bear in mind, I work four days a week, I study, I have various other things going on. My life isn't blessed with massive amounts of extra time at the best of times. So to take on schooling as well was really hard. You know, to start with, schools didn't have lessons planned. I had to suddenly try and come up with engaging lessons he could do on his own while I was at work and then my normal what was normally my study day was generally my working one-on-one -on -one with him day so you know thing my life was really bursting at the seams I was really grateful that this whole situation was fairly short in WA compared to other places and that we could get back to some sort of normal a bit sooner than other places have done so, you know, for me, 2020 was a year of intense pressure, uh, an already busy life that had become almost unmanageable to, in a really unavoidable way. Um, and a year where concern for those I love was at an all-time high. The, the particular vulnerability of our family made it a, you know, a tough time for us. The fact that we are stressed and vulnerable in this <coughs> unprecedented year simply makes us very ordinary. Others lost jobs and struggled to pay their rent or their mortgage and other necessities. Some had family members overseas or interstate who they couldn't be with, particularly if, if a family member was dying and you couldn't be there. What a, what a hard thing for people. Of course, others have had that increased vulnerability because of violence at home. In our Western society, we like to think that we are in control with our relative wealth, our health services, our laws, and all of those things. We think we can manage almost anything the world throws at us. But 2020 proved that something we couldn't even see with the naked eye could overset everything in just a moment, right down to your capacity to buy toilet paper. <laughs> So no matter what we do to try to control everything, each one of us can unexpectedly become vulnerable. Our lives can change in an instant. 
Sometimes when we're in a very vulnerable situation and life has become harder than we can cope with, we wonder, where's God in this? Where's God? Now, if there's one thing we can learn about vulnerable people when we look at the Bible, it's that God is on their side. The ancient Near East, that's the Bible lands and the surrounding nations during the period when the Old Testament was being written, well, you know, that was really a dog-eat-dog kind of a world. Might was right. The strongest man would rule his nation. The strongest nation would crush the other nations until another nation became strong and crushed them. That's how it rolled. The mythologies of these nations are full of cruel gods who seek power and act on capricious whims. But Yahweh, the God of the people of Israel, our God, he stands out among those false gods because of his incredible compassion and care over and over The Old Testament tells us that God is slow to anger and quick to love. It tells us that we shouldn't be afraid because God is with us and that he cares for the vulnerable in society and expects us to do the same. Consider Psalm 82 where we're told, defend the weak and fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Or what about Jeremiah 22, 3? This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, so the people who are most especially vulnerable in society. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. Scattered throughout the Old Testament are lots and lots of texts that tell us that God cares so very deeply for the vulnerable and that he expects us as his people to live in such a way that we reflect to others the reality of who God is and how he cares for them. But, you know, the stories of Old Testament people also tell us that they so often failed at this. They didn't do a great job. So today I just want to have a look at one of these stories of of very desperate vulnerability in the Old Testament. So we're going to turn to Genesis 16 again. It opens with these words. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Not a good thing in that, in that culture. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Now, Abram, as you know, is the name that's later given to Abraham. I got that backwards, didn't I? You knew what I meant. (laughs) And and Sarai becomes Sarah. Um, But that's only after they have children of their own. When we read this text, straight away we learn two things. Firstly, that there are three vulnerable people here. Abram, having no heir, would, as he grew older and feebler, inevitably become vulnerable to those who wanted to take over his vast herds and his wealth. Having heirs would increase his security in old age. So it wasn't just a matter of what do I do with this money, it actually would have affected his security. Sarai, as a childless wife, was in a position of great vulnerability. Throughout history, particularly for women in the higher echelons of society, that inability to provide an heir was seen as the ultimate failure, a reason to be put away into seclusion or divorced, which you know could have been catastrophic. But the most vulnerable person here was Hagar, who's the focus of our second point. Hagar was vul- vulnerable in multiple ways. Firstly, she was an Egyptian, so she was a foreigner. Now, at this point of the story of God's people, there's no nation of Israel as yet. But regardless, she's an outsider, okay? She was a woman in almost every human society. That makes you more vulnerable. That's the way it's been over time. Especially in a society without the real rule of law. From what comes out in this story, we realise she's an unmarried woman, so she has no husband to protect her. In those societies where women are especially vulnerable, the irony is it's men who make women particularly vulnerable and yet it's men who have to protect them so it's a it's a hard space for a woman in that sort of situation she's also a slave 
And at that point, there are really no rules about how you have to treat a slave. There's nothing formal as there would be later under Moses. Um, so she's a possession. She's counted much the same way that you would count the sheep, not, not counted so much as a person. The last point is perhaps the one that you might find a little difficult, a little bit controversial, but she's a victim of sex trafficking as we understand that term today. When we hear this term, in our mind we think it means transporting people from one place to another, but the definition of sex trafficking is something much broader than this. As a slave and someone who's wholly dependent on Abraham and Sarai, Hagar had no choice about entering into this sexual relationship, which places her very firmly within our modern definition of sex trafficking. So this might be a new idea to you and, and maybe one that disturbs you, but it's a reflection of cultural realities in a time that was very long ago. Try to imagine what it would have been like to be in Hagar's shoes for a moment. How would having Abram's baby change her life? At one level, it did give her higher status. However, her life didn't suddenly become more secure. In fact, new kinds of risk entered her life. In Hagar's case, part of that risk came from her own attitude. Genesis tells us that when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Perhaps she thought she had an opportunity to decrease her vulnerability by firmly establishing a place for herself in the household and in relationship with Abram. That's, that's completely understandable when you think about what her life must have been like. But this attitude was obviously made apparent in Hagar's behaviour because Sarai tells Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. Now she knows she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Sarai had envisaged a situation being essentially a transaction. My slave will provide my husband with an heir. She'll have done her duty. End of story. She hadn't imagined how Hagar would feel. Abraham essentially washes his hands of the problem and leaves it to Sarai to deal with. Sadly, Sarai allows her hurt and fear to lead her to mistreat Hagar in retaliation. Her ill treatment's so great that Hagar escapes into the desert. Now, if you thought she was vulnerable before, she is infinitely more vulnerable now. She's pregnant. That's always a vulnerable state for women, even in our society. She has no resources, no protection, no home. And she's escaped into one of the most hostile physical environments on earth. It's a desert. Her vulnerability is complete. She has just one thing in her favour at this time. She's found a spring of water. But she has nothing else, nothing else to aid in her survival. And water alone is not going to save her. Life is hard before and now it is beyond desperate. Imagine her mental turmoil. I'm going to die out here. Me and this little life within me. If only Sarah had never decided to make me the mother of her husband's child. If only I'd just kept my mouth shut and stayed in my place, being the meek slave I'm expected to be. I wouldn't be in this situation. I've no home, no help and no hope. I said a moment ago that Hagar's vulnerability is complete. Well, that's what she would have thought. But there was one factor she had not counted on. Yahweh's care and protection. She's Egyptian, as we know, so she would have been raised to follow other gods. But as a slave in Abram's household, she probably had to participate every now and then in some sort of communal worship situation. But we have no way of knowing if she did that willingly, whether she saw something different about this god of her master, or whether she perhaps just mentally added Yahweh to the gods that she followed, or whether... She didn't want a bar of the whole thing, but just had to go along um, for the sake of appearances. Probably of all the gods she'd been taught about during her life, uh, pro probably all of those gods she saw as remote and impersonal, powerful beings she had to try to please, 
but with whom she'd have had no real relationship. She'd have had no expectation that any of these gods cared for her. Yet suddenly, Yahweh's personal care for her becomes something very, very real. By that spring of water in the desert, an angel appears. And just a little side note, often in the Old Testament where we hear a story about an angel, there's sort of an ambiguity about whether it's an angel as we might understand it or whether it's God. And this, this story seems to lead towards that actually being God's, God's appearance to her. Um, so the angel gives what first seems to be quite a harsh message. Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Mm, that's the thing she's running away from. This wasn't a great situation, but just remember that by having left, she became complete, completely vulnerable and was probably going to die. Her baby would die. This advice will give both of them a chance of life, but more than that, the angel gives her a promise. comes from verse 10. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said, also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. When the angel promises Hagar that she'll give birth to a son, I don't want you to miss one other implication there. It's not just a promise about the inevitable conclusion about pregnancy. It's a promise that she and the child will live. That's, that's something really important. This woman has been nothing all of her life. And she's told that she's actually going to have a legacy. Descendants too, too numerous to account. One day people will be able to look back and say, Hagar, my ancestor, that's where my story begins. That, what an incredible thing. Now, you know that biblical names had important meanings. The angel gives Hagar's baby the name Ishmael. It means God hears. God hears. Here was a woman who's considered of so little worth, who's at the end of her tether and certain of death, who never thought of the gods as personal in any way, being told, God hears. The Lord has heard of your misery and he cares about you. He wants you to have a future and a hope. He's making a personal promise to you about this future. Go and live. Most of us, if we're honest, have felt misery, hopelessness, vulnerability, despair, or worthlessness at some point in our lives, perhaps not in the extreme um, that Hagar experienced, but in that place, Hagar learned that God hears. In your darkest moments, God hears you. If he cared for this Egyptian slave, bought with coins, don't doubt for a moment that he cares for a person who has been bought by the blood of Jesus. Hagar grasps this hope. And in this moment, she understands a great truth about God very, very deeply. Not only has God heard her misery, but he has seen her, truly seen her, the depths of her despair, the stunted longings of her heart, her very essence. Who she is has been wholly laid bare before God and yet worthless, worthless as she thinks she is, it turns out that she, has, she is loved and cared for by God. At this moment, something happens that sets her apart from actually every other person in the Bible. She gives a name to God. Not God telling Hagar what to call him. She turns around and gives him a name. She calls him in Hebrew, El Roy. The God who sees me. That God would see her is not surprising. But she says, I have seen the one who sees me. She's known by God. And now God is known to her. He becomes personal to her, connected to her. And I think we can safely say, loved by her. In a moment, she moves from being a nobody to a child of the king. The angel began by promising her a legacy in this world 
descendants who could look back to their origins in her, but now she becomes somebody with a legacy, an inheritance and a hope in this life and the world to come. What an incredible change of her circumstance. Vulnerability can come to any of us in a moment. However secure, we convince ourselves that our life may be. But in God, we discover that our true security is not our wealth or position. It's not the home we own or rent. It's not even our family or even our health, that thing that sent the world into spin this last year. Our security is found in our relationship with the one who makes and sustains all things, the one who gives us hope and who holds our future. There is a God who sees you. Have you seen him, trusted in him, placed your hope in him? It's my prayer that like Hagar, you will find life and hope in the God who sees you. I want to close today with a prayer of benediction that comes from the book of Numbers. It's an ancient blessing that in many Christian traditions is not just considered a benediction, it is the benediction. It's words to send you out into your families and communities for the coming week. Um, And those words found a special place in 2020. At a time when we couldn't gather together in person to worship, many Christians found, of course, new and innovative ways to come together online. A song which was based on these words was recorded many, many times over by groups of Christians in different locations from various countries and cities, often representing many different denominations, a a show of unity, a, a, a demonstration that we can come together even when we can't come together. Um, these groups couldn't come in together in person because of isolation, so they all recorded the song online, one of those unique new things of 2020. The song is known as The Blessing. The words about the Lord turning his face to us, they're about God seeing us just as he saw Hagar. In a year when so many people felt so alone, we needed to know that God truly sees us, whatever our situation God truly sees you, and I hope that you'll truly see him. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.